Hello everyone, this is Shane Lind at MacArthur Museum of Arkansas Military History. And today I have a very special guest, um, Dr. Joseph uh, Fitzharris, who we were supposed to have in April of last year during a live uh, book signing here at the museum. Uh, unfortunately, because of COVID, that was canceled. But so uh, we've done the next best thing. We brought him here uh, via Zoom. And, but we were going to talk about his book in April, we're gonna talk about that today. It is called The Hardest Lot of Men, the Third Minnesota Infantry uh, in the Civil War. And I don't know if you can see it, but I'm gonna hold it up. Um, it is by the University of Oklahoma Press. And so I've got Dr. Fitzharris here. I'm gonna let him tell you a little bit about himself. Okay, thank you, Shane. It's delightful to see you for the first time after all these long months of emails. What uh, probably is most important to tell you is that, uh, because I'm going to tell you how I got to the topic later, uh, that I've taught the Civil War one way and another for 40 years. And um, obviously, even after retirement, which adds another five or six or seven, uh, out of the 11, I've been retired. So I've been teaching it for quite a while. And uh, I learn something new every time. And almost every time I have a live audience, they ask something new. And that leads to something. And so uh, it's been fun. It is fun. Uh, I took my PhD, though, in a very different field at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, I was an economic historian. But when you teach in small places, as I did for till it got a big, became a big place. Um, you have to teach whatever comes along and you have to have a temporal base. And so I had the, among other things, the Civil War, which was always enjoyable. But somewhere along the line, in the process of uh, gestating this book and another book that I did on World War II Engineer Company, I became a military historian, an honest one. And uh, I'm still a military historian, even though I've retired from teaching and very happy to be retired. So with that, uh, Shane, you want to uh, lead off? Sure. Um, I've read The Hardest Lot of Men. It's a very well-written book. I highly obviously recommend it. Um, what interested me, though, being here at the museum, um, Military Museum, MacArthur Museum, which was once the federal arsenal, um, there is an Arkansas component to the third Minnesota, and we'll get to that later. But first, how did you get interested in what, what really made you uh, decide to write this book? Okay. Um, the, the short answer is a long answer. Um, I'm a member of the Twin Cities Civil War Roundtable and have been for quite a long time. And the tradition there, two traditions you need to be aware of. One is that our meetings begin with a social hour and then dinner and then a speaker. And the other is that the vice president is always planning their next year, their presidential year program. And so I was minding my own business of social hour on a cold, dark, February night in 1994, and the vice president, Joan Sherlock, approached me. And she said, and it's not a question, though it sounds like it, you will give a paper next year, won't you? She was a nurse who raised sheep, so no was not part of her vocabulary as applied to herself. She used it regularly on you. Well, that led to doing a paper um, based out of the James Madison Boulder papers, which were fun to work with. Um, at the time, 25 years ago, they were one of the few complete sets or almost complete sets of papers, letters between husband and wife. There have been a lot more discovered since as grandchildren and great-grandchildren discover their ancestors' letters and either digitize them or sell them or donate them. But 
it was about the only and uh, sort of the easiest accessible uh, file. And so I did a paper on Lizzie, Madison's fiance turned wife. She's much more interesting than he is. But <laughs> truly, he uh, was in the third Minnesota. And what I noticed in the papers, and his collection included veteran association publications, which were printed speeches and so forth, was that he was very upset. Uh, the German term angst is probably the most descriptive uh, about their being surrendered to Nathan Bedford Forrest in July of 1862 in Murfreesboro. And several other men showed the same degree of upset in the veteran papers. But other men couldn't care less, especially by, let's say, the summer of 1863, a year later, they'd gotten over it. Well, this got me intrigued. I, I was wondering, I'm be slowly becoming a military historian in the process, what, uh, what was, how did surrender break this regiment? They'd been a crack unit, superbly disciplined. They could march everybody into the ground. Um, how did they come to be so disorganized, so fallen apart, so broken? Uh, I wanted to get a measure of it and find out how their esprit de corps morale and unit cohesion were rebuilt, because it was rebuilt. Um, Leslie Gordon, who's done magnificent work, and I think she's at Alabama now, Southern Alabama. Anyway, she's uh, one of your near neighbors, uh, did a very nice book on the 16th Connecticut, which was surrendered not once, but twice. And then a whole bunch of them got captured and were prisoners of war till the end, end of the conflict. Uh, that's typical of, of broken units, they get broken, and all you can do with them after that is use them as weak placeholders. But any pressure, any any stress, and they just fall back apart. Third Minnesota, by the time it reports to Vicksburg in June of 1863, has been restored to a fully functional, highly uh, polished, disciplined fighting unit. I was wondering how it happened. And uh, researching that paper, I finally got to the National Archives where I met Thomas Lowry, who, by the way, uh, was one of the doctors working with Kinsey on the sex studies. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. He and his wife, both retired, were delightful, charming people. They were uh, indexing all Union Army court martials so that you could track through and find out how many went absent without leave, how many were hung for this or that or whatever. And uh, so that got me interested in the third Minnesota and I wound up a paper for the Journal of Military History that got a Moncado Prize. And uh, that's how I got into the thing when I presented the paper on uh, court marshals Field, mark, field courts, actually, in justice, military justice. Greg Irwin was in the audience. Greg was at the time uh, at the uh, University of Central Arkansas. He had not yet transited to Temple. And he was just starting the Oklahoma Campaigns and Commanders series. And he said, after the talk, uh, I'll read chapters. Chapters? Said, yeah, of your book. I wasn't writing a book. So there's your answer. I wasn't writing a book. <laughs> it happened by accident. Well, I, I'm friends with Dr. Irwin as well. In fact, he was a professor of mine when I was a, a student at the uh, University of Central Arkansas, and he can be very persuasive, as you know. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, and, you know, it's really a fascinating story in the sense that they were captured, they were paroled, but then they went on to have a very distinguished uh, uh, performance, as you will, um, showed themselves very well. They, went, they were part of the Vicksburg campaign. Mm -hmm. And then um, were 
the viewers might be interested in uh, here in Arkansas is they come to Arkansas. Right. And uh, General Steele was at Helena and they were wanting to make a push to Little Rock. That was the goal. And, and uh, due to various reasons, the, uh, the troops there in Helena were depleted. They needed some reinforcements. And here comes the third Minnesota to Helena first. I'm just wondering for folks from Minnesota, those soldiers from Minnesota, they'd obviously been in the South some, but they arrived, I believe, in July in Helena. Right. right. Which is probably the worst time to be in uh, Arkansas is in the summertime. And I'm wondering um, if, they, if there were any accounts that they how the how they felt about uh you would like to share about all of a sudden we're in hell in arkansas and many soldiers called it hell on earth mm -hmm. well remember they had been in kentucky fighting guerrillas and then were transferred to vicksburg where they got to build defenses they were part of the force protecting the siege troops from johnston's army and Snyder's Bluff and Haynes Bluff, which are north and east of Vicksburg a bit, uh, were remarkably malarial, open enough that the troops got sunstroke. And if they went down to the river or to the creeks to get water or to bathe, and many of them did, uh, there were alligators. And the Union Army lost uh, both men and parts of men to the alligators. So coming to Helena, in one sense, was an improvement. There were no alligators. Right. And, and they were very used to, by that point, heat and humidity. Um, in fact, I, I got interested in the comparisons. I, I'm watching the men comment the further south they went on, on the differences. Comparing home, meaning Minnesota, although for some of them it had been home for a year or less, in uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, Mississippi, now Alabama. And it was fascinating. I, I don't, we don't want to go into that because it doesn't directly appear, apply to your question. Well, I do, if I do remember correctly, they were instrumental and one of the reasons Helena uh, was, was so bad with uh, sickness is the, the practices of the soldiers um, right. were not very good, but the third Minnesota immediately came in and started digging latrines, uh, making themselves in more healthier locations. Right. So it seems like they had some experience with that. Well, it started with their Colonel Henry Lester, who I never found out why, but he, from the day he took command, insisted on latrines and the use of latrines which was unusual. Usually it was the nearest bush. And uh, he liked good water. Now, this is the era before germ theory, and so it was taste and appearance. But they looked for the best water they could find, uh, the least polluted. Uh, they liked clean camps, so the slops were always gathered from the kitchen and either dumped in the river or in a pit. Uh, they took care of themselves, and that was unusual. Um, every time a third Minnesota colonel was a brigade commander, you'll see those kinds of orders issued to the brigade. Use the latrines, put the kitchen slops in the river. Um, but it kept they, the men healthy. What? It kept the men healthy. Oh, you did. Very healthy. They were the healthiest unit in the Arkansas expedition. Um, throughout the entire march, um, you know, they were used to, thanks to Mississippi, bayous and cypress swamps. But those are, if you've been to Minnesota, you'll know, very different from Minnesota swamps and marshes. And um, though they understood heat and malaria, and they'd seen slave plantations and hard scrabble farms and had some sense of the social landscape, um, the combination of the uh, Helena and then Arkansas uh, 
who shall we say, the bugs. Right. Uh, they had not yet encountered scorpions in quantity. Right. And on the Delta, they found scorpions. Uh, and they had not seen, apparently, the mosquitoes in Arkansas were even bigger than in Minnesota. <laughs> they certainly complained about them enough. Uh, so, yeah, there were some differences, but um, not as... Uh, you know, they're less, mm, you can't point to one single thing and say this is it. It's more of a how the whole thing settled on them. Uh, right. They didn't right. dislike Arkansas. Well, as I said, they arrived in late June, July of 1863. Mm -hmm. And can you walk us through the campaign from there? What, what sure. happens when they get here and, and they're all ready to move out? Well, uh, it helps to know that Steele tried to get water. He needed barrels. He ordered 600, 500 gallon barrels. He got zero. So they are short of water all the way from, they went from uh, Helena to the White River, I believe at Clarendon, crossed at Clarendon and went up the so-called West Side to Duval's Bluff. The sick who were in hospitals and convalescent camps in Helena were put on steamboats and brought up to Duval's Bluff. And they were supposed to arrive after the troops. They arrived the day before. So the men arrive in Duval's Bluff and here are all these sick and wounded men just tossed ashore. Some of them dead and some of them dying and some of them, uh, well, most of them quite miserable. Uh, that march was wearing on the men. Uh, casually, in other words, sickness uh, rates skyrocketed throughout the uh, command. The third was suffering too, but it suffered less. And they stopped at uh, Duval's Bluff for several days to kind of recuperate. What's fun is General Steele goes ballistic at the lack of medical care. And the medics are suddenly have been, are, are scourged into building hospitals and getting the sick undercover. Uh, a storm comes through and knocks down all the hospital tents. So <laughs> they had to put those back up and build a hospital, several hospitals. Uh, it becomes a supply depot. Uh, then they set out following the route of the Memphis and Little Rock Railroad. Uh, not completely, they're very from it now and again. Uh, that route, uh, again, lacked water. Every time they crossed prairie outcrops, uh, the sun got to them. And there's this wonderful account from Carl Roos, a Swede, who uh, was probably at that time uh, age 63. He lied on enlistment, claiming he was 44. Uh, bragged that he'd been born in 1800 or 1801. Um, he described the surgeons riding up and down the line of march, giving sun soldiers who were staggering from sunstroke brandy. Totally the wrong thing to do. <laughs> and, but part of the problem was they were lacking water. When they uh, approached um, Huntersville and Bayou Fourche, where Price had his fortifications, then Steele will send the third and several other units and artillery and cavalry to the uh, downriver to cross. Um, and the third is the skirmishers guarding the artillery who are overwatch while the engineers put up a pont ponton bridge so that the cavalry can cross. There's Confederate artillery on the other bank. Everything is within artillery zone. The Confederates, for unknown reasons, do not fire till engineers have finished and the cavalry starts to cross. The Union artillery promptly does counter battery fire and the third brings the artillerists under skirmisher fire. The third's men were very good uh, marksmen. If you've read your James McPherson and so on, 
there's a lot of statements about they didn't do target practice. I've seen the ordinance returns. I've seen the uh, comments about shooting competitions, uh, at least in the West, including the Trans-Mississippi West, uh, a whole lot of ammunition got used up on innocent targets before they ever got shot at anybody else. The third enters the city of Little Rock. It's the first infantry unit in, and it was selected because one, it's the healthiest, Two, it's uh, Steele's strongest, most disciplined, healthiest unit that he trusts. And so he makes them the senior provost guard unit and their colonel becomes the commander of the post of Little Rock. And uh, they become the uh, city's police force and government. Well, you know, uh, talking about them entering Little Rock, there's a very famous painting by Stanley Offord. Um, we have a, a copy of it that we have in our collection here at the mm -hmm. museum that we have on display. But the original, as I understand, hangs in the uh, state capitol there in Minneapolis of Minnesota. Uh, St. Paul. I mean, St. Paul. There, there is a, a significant difference between the two cities. Uh, actually, we did re rehabilitated, the uh, renovated the capitol a few years ago and the previous governor was very politically correct. And so all of the Civil War paintings were up for review. And several of the regiments had selected battle paintings against Indians, and those of course were banished. Right. Uh, the third somehow managed to survive and be hung back in its place in the reception room, the governor's reception room. Um, the other regiments had, except its sister regiment raised at the same time, the 4th Regiment, has a similar painting of entering Vicksburg in all spiffed up, nice company, column by companies um, to place their flag on the city hall. Well, the 3rd selects this entry of the regiment into Little Rock. Everybody else chose battle paintings. It, and to me, it's one of my favorite paintings for a lot of reasons. Now, I, I don't know how ad accurate of a painting it is, although I assume it's somewhat accurate, but they're, they're coming across the pontoon bridges that they, I assume that they mm -hmm. had placed, and they're going by the old state house, which was the, the state capital right. here in Little Rock. And so, but it's just, they have the drummer boy in front. Mm -hmm. And they have some citizens looking on, and yeah. to me, it's a, it's, it's a, a portrait of a of a unit that is proud of itself, but is a veteran unit. Right. And, uh, it's very striking. Um, right. Uh, it's a, and that's yeah. another reason I was very interested when I um, knew that you had written this book on the the third Minnesota. It has a direct connection now. You say they get here, they're one of the strongest units, um, healthiest. And as you know, uh, the museum here is in the actual arsenal building, right. the federal arsenal building that was here, that was part of the, the post here. And they, I would imagine most of them are stationed here. No. No? Behind me is the, uh, your, photo of the third Minnesota in formation before the state capitol. Uh, I chose that purposely. Uh, they were quartered in the state capitol building. Oh, okay. Yeah. The um, Supreme Court chamber was used as the post headquarters. Uh, the court's library was used as the regimental headquarters. Uh, officers were quartered in smaller offices. Uh, some of the larger rooms were company quarters. They are moved out in January when the Constitutional Convention is held, and they will build uh, uh, cabins or shanties on the grounds. Um, but they're quartered in the in the state house, and that's where they from 
where they operate from as the provost guard? Well, as the provost guard, what was some of the um, their duties and um, some things that they, any incidents that occurred while they were here that you would like to share? Well, they are the police force. They uh, enforce both the existing city ordinances and whatever decrees the post commander issues. Uh, they're in charge of distributing rations to the needy. Uh, the Catholic sisters had a convent, which they, and I suspect a school, and they turned it into a hospital. The sisters received rations. They were also provided guards. Um, they run the welfare program, if you will. They take care of the indigent. Uh, they'd learned, by the time they left Nashville, they had learned that if you could get the women of the South to cooperate, to co-opt them, if you will, life was a whole lot better for everybody. And so they worked very hard. You can see it in a number of the letters and so on, that they understood that if you got the women, the men would follow not willingly and not happily. And of course, the men were subject to different rules than the women. Women could get away with a lot more. Uh, so in Little Rock, they turn on the charm again. And you can see that in some of the letters where they comment on it. Um, things worked out well enough that families who had left Little Rock return. Families who had sent their children away bring them back so that there's a, a growth of the population. And um, it turns out there was fairly good or strong union sentiment in Little Rock and in the area up to Fayetteville. And um, that grows dramatically because of the uh, occupation. What's ironic is Steele is condemned by his federal, fellow federal generals for being so lenient he didn't like it either, but he was told to do it that way by Lincoln, who had, was going to use this as his first reconstruction experiment. And the third Minnesota was the ideal unit to implement it because they were gunning for the women, if you will, to right. cooperate. And uh, the result was that um, unionist sentiment grew so fast, it outran Lincoln's plans. They're calling for a constitutional convention months before he was ready for it, mm -hmm. which, which caused a whole bunch of upset. And um, even though the generals didn't like the policies that were implemented, uh, and, and Steele didn't either, uh, and they lead to, they're part of the reason eventually Steele gets removed. His peers don't think he's up to the job. Uh, he, Worked fairly well, um, at least. And one of the things that they would have been uh, around for and, and part of the post, uh, running the post, uh, would be an event that occurred with David O'Dot. Right. Who was caught uh, uh, as a spy, was tried as a spy, right. and executed. Mm -hmm. Um. Now, were the third Minnesota, were they the ones who would have escorted him out to the gallows? Would they, they, you know, would, they, would they have been the unit that would have done that since they were in charge of, say, the city? Uh, I know that they were part of the force that formed the square around his execution. Uh, I'm not sure that they were part of the guard that escorted him. Um, I do know that one of the third's officers, I think it was Captain uh, Benjamin Rice, who later becomes the first United States Senator from Arkansas in Reconstruction, um, was his judge advocate. That is to say, both the prosecutor and the defense attorney. <laughs> and, uh, and there were even, uh, and we talked about this uh, before this interview, uh, that there were some letters that some of the third Minnesota soldiers recounted the hanging of David. Right. Uh, most of them took it, you know, today we would say hanging a teenager 
is just not not done. Uh, their view of it was a much more hard-headed. He was caught, red-handed, convicted. Uh, exactly, and they had been through. Had seen much killing and oh, yeah. and been through hard battles, and mm -hmm. they probably didn't give that much thought. They had seen much worse. Right. Uh, especially the ones who had fought against the Indians in the summer of 1862 and saw them mutilated bodies, that kind of thing. And it was here in Arkansas when their term of enlistment. Right. And uh, they were going home? Or did some of them re-enlist? Uh, Three-fourths of the regiment re-enlisted. Uh, the ones who did not uh, were discharged in Little Rock and then sent home. And it's very weird. Those guys paid off in Little Rock have to pay their own way home. Hmm. They have to get their own way home. Now, some of them took discharge and uh, stayed in uh, either Little Rock or Duval's Bluff. One man, a, pr a private, got a job as a quartermaster clerk and went from $13 a month to $130, I think, a month. Just boom. Um, so. so it's safe to say that some of them, after their enlistment, stayed here in Arkansas and made lives. They did. Um, and of course, when the regiment goes home in 1865, some more men stay. And s several of the men who went back to Minnesota come back to Arkansas. Uh, so they must have um, found Arkansas appealing. This, many of them did. Um, I didn't see anybody who you know, knocked the dust of Arkansas off their shoes and said never again. Um, some of them uh, came back and actually stayed for the rest of their lives. Um, and of course, we don't know on a lot of them what happened because they didn't tell the Veteran Association. And unless you go through all the pension forms. Right. I was wondering, after the war, did they hold reunions like many of the regiments? And they did. Uh, none were held outside of Minnesota. Um, almost all of them were held in Minneapolis. A couple were held in Red Wing. Um, they tried to avoid St. Paul. They had a very bad relationship with the capital city, um, which confused a lot of people. But uh, I, I tried to sort it out in the book. So. Right. Uh, well, what, what is, do you believe, the lasting legacy of the third Minnesota? Well, in terms of Arkansas, what they left behind was um, a small change. They were sent to Batesville, and then when General Thompson surrendered at Jacksonport, they were two companies were sent to Jacksonport to be the host for the surrender. Um, working in that part of Arkansas rather quickly, they helped reestablish county government and municipal government. They lent out men to be clerks and this kind of thing. Um, they, again, had draw authority to draw. Uh, they had a steamboat assigned, and they had power to draw on the federal quartermaster for rations. Occasionally, they even gave away a mule to indigents, who, the locals who were starving, and many were. Uh, and they helped to pacify the region. By 1865, as you know, guerrilla warfare, it didn't matter which side you were on. Uh, there was kind of a consensus between Union and Confederate armies that most of the guerrillas ought to be shot on sight because they didn't support either side and they were just plain dangerous. And the third helped to pacify that part of uh, Arkansas and um, helped to transit blacks out of slavery. 
uh, which was not the instantaneous process. Uh, if you read the Bowler letters, he talks about one uh, uh, owner who uh, just absolutely refused. And uh, there's another uh, example, um, Matson talks about it, Colonel Matson, where a uh, slave owner, former owner, uh, shot a man. He was going to punish the man's son, and the man took his son, no, you can't do that, boom. Well, the man's wife came in and filed a complaint. And when Matson and others went out to talk to the man, a distinguished uh, doctor in the area, he admitted it, told the same story. And was totally flabbergasted when he was taken off to Little Rock for a military tribunal trial. So there's a certain role there. But you know, they not only their combat experience, but they also were, it shows the side of their human, humanitarian mission. Mm -hmm. to help as Lincoln wanted to do to um, heal, the, heal uh, the country after the war. Right. To bring it together. Well, the, the, thank you for writing this book. Thank you for being here. Our time is running low. But it is the hardest lot of men, the third Minnesota infantry in the Civil War. We have copies here at the museum for local folks. If you want to come by and, and purchase one, we have them. Go online. There's various uh, outlets you can go to, to to order online, especially anyone who, who um, is interested in Arkansas Civil War history. Civil War, Civil War history in general, but since we are here at the museum, um, a lot of folks from Arkansas are going to be tuning in. But uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating book, and uh, thank you for writing it. Thank you for being part here. I wish you could have been here back in April to give uh, your lecture and the book signing. Maybe we'll do that in the future when the pandemic is over. But uh, thank you so much. For, uh, for being part of this. My pleasure, Shane, and thank you for arranging this, and it's good to meet you, however, virtually. <laughs>